There's a switch on the side. <laughs> there you go. Hello. Okay. Good. Good evening, and welcome to the New York Society Library, the oldest library in the city, where we are about to celebrate Margaret Fuller. And I wish I had been in the audience when Emerson lectured at our downtown location in 1842, and Walt Whitman was in the audience. It was the first time they met. Even though Margaret Fuller didn't speak here, we did have that connection with her friend and mentor, Emerson. And Nathaniel Hawthorne's copy of Byron is now on display in our current exhibition. In order to support wonderful programs like this, please give generously to the library. Megan Marshall mentioned to me that in doing her research on Margaret Fuller in New York City, our library had great images and maps that were extremely helpful. It is so exciting to read this wonderful biography, which brings to vivid life this brilliant woman whose ideas dazzled New England's cultural elite. By quoting from Margaret Fuller's letters, Marshall conveys her passionate intensity, intellect, and valor as she struggles with private heartaches, yet had amazing achievement as an innovative teacher, lecturer, and editor. Her famous conversations changed the way women's sense of how they could live and think. I have admired Margaret Fuller for so many years that I call her Margaret now. <laughs> and it was such a pleasure to read this compassionate portrait, which deserves every glowing review it has received. We actually have a relative of Margaret Fuller in the audience, Allie Fuller. Where is she? There she is. Stand up. <laughs> See how, are you related to? Oh, yay! Gosh, now I feel really close to her. And when um, I kept on hoping this time the ship wouldn't sink and perhaps Margaret could have some happiness on her return to America. Megan Marshall is the author of the Peabody Sisters, which won so many awards. The Francis Parkman Prize, the Mark Litton History Prize, the Massachusetts Book Award in nonfiction and was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize. Her essays and reviews have appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, The Atlantic, and many publications. She is a recipient of the Guggenheim NEH Fellowships, and uh, Megan Marshall teaches narrative nonfiction and the art of archival research in the MFA program at Emerson College. And now, let us welcome Megan Marshall. Thank you so much, all of you, for coming out uh, between thunderstorms, I guess. We're <laughs> lucky tonight. Um, I uh, want to begin by saying that although Margaret Fuller lived in New York City for less than two years in the mid-1840s, um, this was a really transformative time for her. And so I'm going to spend most of this evening's talk on those years in New York City. But. Um, before I do that, I'll just give a very brief introduction um, to Fuller for those of you who don't know much about her. I think there may be some here. Um, and I want to do this by way of, I, I was asked a few weeks ago to write a short uh, entry for a blog called My Book, The Movie. <laughs> and, uh, I think they really wanted to know how I would cast the characters in my book, and I'm not going to reveal what I said about that, but I had to write a little precy of, of Fuller's life, and this is what I ended up doing. Margaret Fuller was born 30 years before the invention of photography, but she lived the most cinematic of lives. An intellectual prodigy and brilliant conversationalist, she talked her way into the genius cluster centered around Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau in mid-19th century New England. But the life of the mind wasn't enough for her. At 35, she took a job as front page columnist for Horace Greeley's New York Tribune. The only woman in the newsroom, she sought out the seamy side of the great metropolis, <coughs> visiting its prisons, mental asylums, and orphanages, interviewing their inmates, and she made these characters the centerpiece of her passionate 
advocacy journalism. After two years in New York, she persuaded Greeley to send her to Europe as a foreign correspondent, reaching France and Italy during the 1848 revolutions, where she befriended the important radicals of the time. She was the lone American journalist in Rome during the brutal 1849 siege, and she tended the wounded revolutionaries as a hospital nurse while carrying on an affair with a young soldier who became the father of her son, conceived out of wedlock and born in secret in a hill town outside of Rome. This is the movie part. <laughs> this movie has to be set in Rome. When the short-lived Roman Republic collapsed, the three sailed for America only to be drowned in a shipwreck 300 yards offshore at Fire Island in a near hurricane. Margaret and her lover's bodies were never found. Two-year-old Nino washed to shore where the few surviving sailors buried him in a trunk in the sands. So this does leave out a great deal, as movie synopses do. Uh, it leaves out the flowering of her feminism in New England, um, the conversations for adult women that she led, that Jeanette mentioned. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Um, the Dial, her editorship of The Dial, the Transcendentalist's great uh, literary journal, and A Journey to the West that she made that was also very influential. And of course, the Woman, Woman in the 19th Century, which was her great um, feminist work, which is where I'm going to start tonight. Um, I'm going to read two passages from the book that really kind of give you a sense of her accomplishment while in New York City. Um, and then after that, I'm going to show some slides that um, are about some of the research that I did, and um, you can play biographer with me as we look at those. So, um, Woman in the 19th Century had its roots in um, Fuller's time in New England, teaching the conversations for women and really um, engaging with the transcendentalist group, fighting with Emerson about gender roles, what we would call gender roles today, and studying the marriages that were going on around her, most of which seemed to be going badly, or some of which. Um, and this led to a, front, uh, a, a long essay in the Dial, um, which I think is really the most important publication of that magazine called um, The Great Lawsuit, Man Versus Men, Woman Versus Women. Um, and Horace Greeley, who was just starting his New York Tribune at the time, read this. It was, a, he thought, an explosive work, and it should be a book, and encouraged her to expand it as, at the same time as he was also inviting her down to write for the Tribune. So she took, took him up on this and decided it would be a good idea to have a New York publisher for the book. She really wanted to kind of distance herself from the transcendentalists, at least as far as getting a wider readership. Um, the dial that she had edited had been, um, you know, it had a certain kind of success, but it was also um, parodied a great deal, some aspects of it. So um, she accepted his offer to publish Woman in the 19th Century, and she even, um, in expanding it, spent some time um, in the fall of 1844 at um, Fishkill Landing on the Hudson. She had become very interested in a, a reform um, of the women's prison at Sing Sing, and she wanted to visit the women prisoners there, and she included them in, in her book in the expanded form. So um, in the end, she moved to New York in 1844 in December, and the book came out in, in March of 1845. So this is a little passage about, about the book as it came out. Margaret, who had always admired the marriage of her friends, Sophia Peabody and Nathaniel Hawthorne, and covertly acknowledged their holy and equal union in the great lawsuit as a model partnership of two creative minds, would have been surprised to hear Sophia's private condemnation of the treatise that became woman in the 19th century. What do you think of the speech which Queen Margaret has made from the throne, Sophia wrote to her mother after reading the original Dial essay. It seems to me that if she were married truly, she would no longer be puzzled about the rights of woman. In the newlywed Sophia's view, Margaret had no right to comment on the sacred relation. Marriage for Sophia was a revelation of woman's true destiny and place, which could not be imagined by anyone who had never experienced it. When the book appeared, Sophia's opinion did not change. 
A wife only can understand the dynamics of marriage, she complained, again to her mother, and in expanding her subject to take in the plight of prostitutes, these were the women uh, she had visited at Sing Sing, most of whom were imprisoned for prostitution. Mar uh, Margaret had given voice to thoughts that should not be spoken. Other critics echoed in print Sophia's private reservations. No unmarried woman has any right to say anything on the subject would be a recurrent theme with reviewers who dismissed the book, which nevertheless swiftly found an audience as booksellers snatched up the first printing of 1,500 copies within a week to meet customer demand. But Margaret's disinterested vantage point was precisely what enabled her to render so discerning a critique in a book that reviewers, whether favorably inclined or not, agreed was the first significant work to take the liberal side in the question of woman's rights since the days of Mary Wollstonecraft. Margaret wasn't married. She had no personal stake in defending the institution and plenty of experience in discovering that woman's true destiny and place could be found elsewhere. She was free to observe and free to say what she had witnessed if she dared. Other married friends, such as the writer Lydia Maria Child, whose difficult marriage may have made her especially sympathetic, found Woman in the 19th Century to be a bold book. Child had readily braved public outrage over her abolitionist writings, but she confessed to a friend that she would not have dared to have written some things in Margaret's book, though it would have been safer for me being married. Still, they need to have been said, and Margaret was brave to have done it. Margaret was a woman of more powerful intellect, comprehensive thought, and thorough education than any other American authoress, Child wrote in the Broadway Journal, and it took more courage and intelligence to speak up for women, one half the people, than for enslaved blacks. And it took even more courage to connect the two forms of servitude and place them within a far-reaching system of oppression that treated everyone of their humanity, as Margaret had done with this book. There exists in the minds of men a tone of feeling toward women as towards slaves, Margaret had written. While anyone is base, none can be entirely free and noble. Although Margaret's additions to the original essay almost tripled it in length, its core arguments remained those laid out in the great lawsuit, whose subtitle, Man versus Men, Woman versus Women, alerted readers to the comprehensive nature of her inquiry. Neither idea, uh, sorry, a man and woman, she asserted, were two halves of the same thought. Neither idea could be fully realized as long as man failed to see that woman's interests were identical with his and that by the law of their common being, he could never reach his true proportions while she remained in any wise shorn of hers. Conventional modes of behavior and patterns of development the separate spheres, private and public, in which women and men were expected to conduct their lives, prevented individual women and men from attaining their true proportions. A house is no home for a woman unless it contained food and fire for the mind as well as for the body. Every human being, woman as well as man, must be allowed as a nature to grow, as an intellect to discern, as a soul to live freely. You can hear the transcendentalism in this feminism. <laughs> Working at her desk in Fishkill Landing, Margaret had surrounded herself with volumes of Spinoza, Confucius, and Plato spread open for reference, and she made use of them. But the extraordinary power and enduring appeal of women in the 19th century lay in Margaret's <coughs> prescient readings of women's lives related in anecdote and biographical summary. Many women, if not Sophia Hawthorne, found their own simmering frustrations acknowledged and their secret hopes affirmed in the book. For extraordinary as she was, Margaret had plenty of sisters, as she now addressed her readers, who had experienced similar cruel slights and crushing disappointments and could thrill to Margaret's recitals of them, as well as to her promise of a better day to come if only women would rouse their latent powers and assume their inheritance. Margaret pointed to the beginnings of woman's suppression in childhood when, instead of calling out like a good brother, you can do it if you only think so, boys instead taunted their sisters, girls can't do that, girls can't play ball. When girls showed themselves the equals of boys in schoolwork, their accomplishments were robbed from them by being labeled masculine. 
Let it not be said, Margaret admonished, wherever there is energy or creative genius, she has a masculine mind. This is something she was often subject to. And too few girls had the opportunity to face intellectual challenges and succeeded them. If she knows too much, she will never find a husband, was a sad and self-perpetuating prejudice maintained by all too many parents. The corresponding practice of limiting the education of girls to subjects that would make them better companions and mothers for men was a pernicious one. A being of infinite scope must not be treated with an exclusive view to any one relation. Instead, give the soul free course and the being will be fit for any and every relation to which it might be called. Margaret herself had become one of those women who know too much, whom men were disinclined to marry. Yet, from her lonely vantage point, Margaret envisioned a noble future for women. They required, first, much greater range of occupation to rouse their latent powers. She called on men to remove arbitrary barriers. We would have every path laid open to woman as freely as to man. Because men do not look at both sides, women themselves must become the best helpers of one another. Let them think, let them act till they know what they need. Then, if you ask me what offices they may fill, I reply, any. In what would become the most quoted line she ever wrote, Margaret exhorted her readers to let them be sea captains, if you will. You probably know that line. So she found her way to New York, and um, she was living, actually, with the Greeley family up in Turtle Bay. I'll show you a slide of that, how it looked then when she lived there in a minute. Um, and she really kind of took to the streets as a reporter, which was not initially what Horace Greeley had expected. She was going to be the literary editor and continue her writing about books and, and music and, and art. Um, but she, uh, he kind of let her do what she wanted. She'd already been interested in the prisons at Sing Sing. And so this um, picks up on a day when she's about to go out and do a little reporting. The mid-March day was dull and dubious. The sky led and then lowering. This is quoting from her column. The birds silent in the chill air that had brought a swift end that morning to one of New York's unseasonable warm spells. But the doer weather seemed suitable for the outing, a visit to the pauper establishments. First, the old Bellevue Alms House on the outer limits of the city on the East River at the foot of 26th Street, and then by open boat to Blackwell's Island, now Roosevelt Island, a quarter mile offshore, for tours of the recently constructed farm school for orphans, the asylum for the insane and the massive crenellated fortress of the penitentiary, filled already with 1,200 inmates. All four were institutions that admonish us of stern realities, the chill winds of misfortune that could so readily affect the blight of nature's bloom, Margaret would write in Our City Charities, her most comprehensive front page Tribune editorial to date on societal ills. These and other similar establishments she had visited since beginning to write for the Tribune in December 1844, the privately run Bloomingdale Insane Asylum in rural Upper Manhattan, the dank overcrowded jail in the heart of the city known as the Tombs, should be looked at by all, Margaret instructed, repeating the imperative twice in her opening paragraph. She urged her readers not to sink listlessly into selfish ease, now that the city had completed the three facilities on former pasture land on Blackwell's Island, the pauper's new Arcadia. The ambitious building plan was part of a wave of publicly funded social reforms that had swept the young nation since the establishment of the Worcester State Lunatic Hospital in Massachusetts a decade earlier in 1833, an initiative that had gathered the impoverished mentally ill from local jails across the Commonwealth where they were normally held alongside convicted criminals and provided them with medical treatment in healthful surroundings at the centrally located hospital. As the population of needy citizens, criminals, and other outcasts swelled in big cities, the notion of providing enlightened care and remediation took hold elsewhere, and by 1845, few would have disagreed with Margaret's statement that parsimony was the worst prodigality when it came to the treatment of the poor man or the prisoner. 
though just what should be done inside the new buildings continued to be a matter of debate. Margaret argued that New Yorkers should play an active role as visitors, both to monitor progress and, more important, to extend a representative hand of care to the inmates so that their benefactor's intelligent sympathy would be felt directly. The acceptance of public charity, she wrote, can be injurious to the recipient in an atmosphere devoid of human kindness. Men treated with respect are reminded of self-respect, was the reform doctrine Margaret preached, allying herself with progressives like Eliza Farnham, the matron at Sing Sing, who had the female prisoners under her care, keeping journals, tending gardens, and rehearsing for choral concerts. Yet Margaret knew that few of her readers would heed her advice and follow the route she took on that dreary March day. Few would witness the vagrant, degraded air of the men residing in the almshouse, who lacked any employment except to raise vegetables for the establishment and prepare clothing for themselves. There were no books, no classes, no opportunities to learn a trade, no openings to a better way of life. Few would see the young mothers next door in Bellevue Hospital exposed to the careless scrutiny of male visitors as they nursed their newborns and echo Margaret's plea to allow them privacy. Few would be greeted on entry to the hospital yard by the little Dutch girl, a misshapen dwarf child abandoned in the city by some showman, or notice along with Margaret how the poor gnome ran expectantly to the gate every time it was opened to search the face of each new visitor. Out on Blackwell's Island, the farm school, which to Margaret's eye was nothing more than a school upon a small farm, also failed to provide any vocational training for its young charges, even though, as Margaret noted, children have vital energy enough for many things at once and learn more from books when their attention is quickened by a variety of pursuits. I wish that people would listen to her now about this, too. <laughs> She admired the well-ventilated dormitories and the way the school's infants were arranged in a circle at mealtimes, like a nest full of birds to be spoon-fed by affectionate nurses. But she worried about how the older students, who were required to leave the school at age 12, would find work. Many of these showed, by their unformed features and mechanical movements, the ill effects of having been treated by wholesale. They were not accorded the respect that engenders self-respect. The Asylum for the Insane, too, despite its location on the island's grassy headlands and its ingenious design, two three-story neoclassical dormitory wings with a row of columns marking their separate entrances, one for women and the other for men, extended at a right angle from a central octagonal structure containing the doctor's rooms, appeared to serve as little more than a warehouse here, Margaret found the inmates crouching in the corners of their rooms. They had no eye for the stranger, no heart for hope. In stark contrast to patients in the privately run Bloomingdale, where the shades of character and feeling were nicely kept up, decorum of manners preserved, and the insane showed in every way that they felt no violent separation betwixt them and the rest of the world, and might easily return to it. The penitentiary was gloomier still. In fact, one of the gloomiest scenes that deforms this great metropolis. There, 700 women, more than half the prison's population, were incarcerated simply as a social convenience, without regard to pure right or a hope of reformation, in Margaret's view. Uh, these are the prostitutes who she thought were wrongly imprisoned. Their, their crime was not theirs. Um, so most of the imprisoned women had been prostitutes as at, um, yeah, as at Sing Sing, most of the imprisoned women had been prostitutes, and I have always felt great interest in these women who are trampled in the mud to gratify the brute appetites of men, Margaret wrote afterward to a friend, and wished I might be brought naturally into contact with them. She was convinced, as she told Horace Greeley, they were women like myself, save that they are victims of wrong and misfortune. Writing for the Tribune gave her the opportunity to test her intuition and the chance to speak out, as she had in Woman in the 19th Century, against the hypocritical laws that made a woman pay for a man's crime. Why should women receive the punishment due to the vices of so large a portion of the rest? Acute first-hand observation 
enlivened by intelligent sympathy, had quickly become Margaret's distinctive style as a critic and increasingly as an advocate for social reform. To read, to hear, to see what the Tribune's many subscribers could or would not, and then to shape an instructive message from her experience was the means she chose to aid in the great work of mutual education, as she summed up her ambitions as a journalist in a letter to her friend James Freeman, Freeman Clark. To her relief, James had emerged, perhaps in an effort to make amends for his younger brother's indifference, as the chief, sometimes it seemed, the sole supporter of Margaret's new vocation among her old Boston friends. Carrie, might, Carrie Sturgis, her friend, might offer only slighting praise for those who like introductions, your criticisms must be of value, and Waldo Emerson complained that the job was made acceptable only by good pay, $10 per week, $2 higher than Greeley had paid his previous literary editor. Emerson said that this job was honorable to Margaret, but not satisfactory to me. James Clark understood Margaret best now, as he had so many years earlier, and recognized that the New York Tribune was an excellent organ through which to speak to the public. Her Tribune articles, which had more ease, grace, freedom, and point to them, he told her, were better written than anything of yours I have read. It was the perfect job for Margaret, who always had an opinion on almost any subject, as well as the verbal facility and the compulsion to express it. The rich extempore writing that Thoreau had admired in the great lawsuit, her gift of talking with pen in hand, enabled her to turn out three or four articles per week, more than 250 in 18 months. The goal of mutual education, as well as the space constraints and frequent deadlines, forced a clarity and efficiency of expression that she had not submitted to previously. Margaret was aware that her old friends think I ought to produce something excellent, another book, Yet, as she wrote to James, she had spent all of her writing life so far in the depths. She expected that an abode of some length in the shallows may do me no harm. Like James, Margaret was already pleased with the results. In the shallows, writing about vitally important surface realities, the sun comes full upon me. Seventy newspapers were listed in the 1845 New York City directory. The Tribune vied with the New York Sun and the New York Herald for top circulation figures in a battle that took place on the page. Unwilling to stoop to publishing lurid accounts of murder and mayhem, the stories that sold the lesser publications, Horace Greeley nevertheless valued the human interest reporting at which Margaret instinctively excelled. The characters and incidents she'd habitually recorded in her private journals noting they might make scenes for a drama or materials for romance, now found their way into her journalism, as in the case of the little Dutch girl at Bellevue, who, Margaret wrote, would have suggested a thousand poetical images and fictions to the mind of Victor Hugo or Sir Walter Scott. She exhorted her readers, do you want to link these fictions, which have made you weep, with facts around you where your pity might be of use? Go to the penitentiary at Blackwell's Island. Her readers might not go, but Margaret did, turning her fact-finding missions into emotionally charged narratives in order to be of use. It took some time for Margaret to write as a New Yorker, however. The early news she delivered came from New England and betrayed a predisposition to think of Boston as a chief mental focus to the new world, as she wrote in her first article, a review of Waldo Emerson's second collection of essays which privately she had concluded were more fine than searching. <laughs> On Thanksgiving in 1844, celebrated in early December, she applauded Massachusetts, where the old spirit which hallowed the day still lingers and forbids that it should be entirely devoted to play and plum pudding. At Christmas time, she reviewed The Liberty Bell for 1845, an anthology sold to benefit the annual Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Fair praising the contributions of the men of color, in particular, the work of a new writer named Frederick Douglass, only six years out of bondage. But by the time of her column on Our City Charities, Margaret had experienced enough of the city to begin addressing her readers as one among them. She had attended concerts of the New York Philharmonic Society, where she heard symphonies by Beethoven, Haydn, and Spohr, performed with a degree of perfection worthy a great metropolis. 
She had walked or ridden the city's cobblestone streets by horse-drawn omnibus, discovering the manicured parks at Washington Square and Union Place, as well as the bustling commercial blocks of Nassau Street near the Tribune offices, where two dozen of Greeley's competitors printed and hawked their wares. There is no reason why New York should not become a model for other states in social reform, she concluded. We trust that interest on this subject will not slumber, for there is wealth enough, intelligence, and good desire enough, and surely need enough. So, those are my passages for you. And now, we're going to play a biographer here, or I'll let you in on some of the behind the scenes business of being a biographer, perhaps. Um, this image of Margaret Fuller was something, you know, since I wrote The Peabody Sisters, so much has exploded what you can find on the internet. And, um, and so some of these items showed up this way. This um, silhouette of Margaret Fuller was up for auction at liveauctioneers.com in 2007. And then somebody bought it. And I didn't know about it till afterwards. But um, this is from 1843, and it actually says, you probably can't see on it, but um, it describes her as a lecturer, which is a little odd. I don't think she thought of herself that way, but, uh, but it was done in New York in 1843, um, which is possible. She passed through New York on this trip to the West that I mentioned. So, um, and the silhouette artist is, is a known person, so I, I don't think there's any question about the... the um, truthfulness of this being labeled a silhouette of Margaret Fuller. Um, so I, I didn't, in the end, put this in the book, but I'm showing it to you now. And um, I think it's, I guess, um, you know, I, I was trying in the book to use images that would really help us today identify with Fuller. And I think maybe when you see this large, it does, but it's a small silhouette with no real features, it's it's a little harder to connect. But anyway, I think I think it's quite beautiful and extraordinary find. Um, this is um, a street scene of Cambridgeport. Margaret Fuller was born in um, in Cambridge, and her family lived till she was about twelve or thirteen in Cambridgeport, which was a um, had been um, there had been great hopes for this part of Cambridge to become a thriving community, um, but various enterprises, a, a canal and one thing and another just kind of failed and it never happened and her family ultimately moved from there. But um, And um, interestingly, the house that she was born in still stands and is a, a neighborhood service center, the Margaret Fuller neighborhood house um, around the corner from now the Google offices in Kendall Square. <laughs> um, so Kendall Square is coming up again. Um, and But there are no images of that house from the time that she lived in it or even from the 19th century. So uh, I was looking for an image that would um, kind of convey the character of the place. And one of the things that it was known about this house in, that she lived in was that there was a soap factory across the way. And what I liked about this is that it's, I don't think it's the same street, but there is a soap factory in the middle, which I think is the kind of darkened archway. Um, and, you know, soap factory then was a rather small concern, not what we really think of as a factory. But um, when the family moved to a rather opulent mansion on Dana Street, on Dana Hill, um, her little brother said that he missed the soap factory across the street. <laughs> um, maybe, I don't know, bubbles were rising up and that attracted him. Um, this is a, uh, image is owned by the uh, Boston Athenaeum. Um, here, one of Margaret Fuller's many firsts was that she well, gained admission to the Harvard Library, the Harvard College Library. And um, many of you may know the Harvard campus, and there's this enormous Widener Library, but that's not what was there then. Um, but Gore Hall was a brand new building in 1844 when she talked her way in. This was where she researched and wrote her first book, which was called Summer on the Lakes in 1843, as she had taken a trip to the West and, and visited Indian encampments and, and kind of examined the life of the new settlers out there. And it was really a, a quite a powerful indictment of what already was, you know, the ravaging of the West and its peoples. Um, but she wanted to be as knowledgeable about it as she could, so she um, talked her way into the library and it was um, 
it was in this building, Gore Hall, which I think was um, one of the, f maybe the first building that Harvard built to kind of show its, uh, I don't know, its greatness. It's, uh, it's kind of gothic looking, but they had had previously the brick buildings, which you still see on the yard. And, and um, so, although it's not there now, it was a great demonstration to the world of, of its, um, of Harvard's beginnings as, uh, you know, the height of intellection, the library. And this is a daguerreotype that's in the Harvard collections, the Harvard Houghton collections, and also from this other thing I liked about it, it's just one very early days of daguerreotype. And I like also that you can see these teeny trees that have been planted. So although it's the old times, we're seeing something that was very new then, both the, the medium and the building and the plantings. Um, now here are, I have a, a series of images that um, I was able to see online from the New York Public Library. And um, I, I didn't actually, because I didn't use, actually, I, I used the street scene from Cambridge Port in the book, but I didn't use the Gore Hall, and I didn't use this either for New York. And I didn't really track this down, but my understanding is that this house you see, rather fancy in the background, is the house that the Greeleys had rented and that Fuller was living in. So um, you can see Turtle Bay, which I guess is the, where the, the UN is now, um, had a rather different look. <laughs> Um, she was there in 1845 to 6, this is 1853. Um, okay, and, but she spent a lot of time wandering these rocks and even bathing a bit um, in the waters. Um, and of course, um, okay, and this, these are some of the buildings that I described in the reading that I just gave. So this was the Almshouse Hospital at Bellevue, uh, which I was able to figure out, I mean, you probably all know where everything is or was, both is and was, but um, I, one of the great uh, little, I say little because it was small, had an 1845 directory, city directory of, of New York, and it listed a lot of directions to get places. It wasn't a map. I mean, if you looked up a street, it would tell you how to walk to that street or what the streets, adjoining streets were. It, was not, it didn't, didn't work the way. Um, a directory would now, um, and it had all kinds of lists. That's how I knew how many newspapers there were. It listed all the newspapers, it listed all the churches, it listed all kinds of things. Um, but anyway, that's part of the reason I figured out that this was at the end of 26th Street, as I read to you just then. Um, and so this was um, called Bellevue. It was a hospital then, not a hospital. You know, a hospital for the poor it wasn't didn't have a connection with as a mental hospital, so far as I know. Then, but there may be people here who can correct me on these things because I'm not a New Yorker. Um, and this, I, I love this series of the uh, establishments that she visited on Blackwell's Island. Um, this is the penitentiary, so I was able to describe this building, which you know with its crenellations. Um, and it was, you know, quite new at the time. And, you know, it, it didn't take very long before these institutions became, even as Margaret was saying, not, not, um, not the healthful places for reform that their builders had imagined. But you kind of see in these early engravings a sense of hopefulness that, um, that the people had who, who erected them. Um, and here it says, view of the lunatic asylum and madhouse on Blackwell's Island, New York. Um, and there you can see this octagonal um, portion of the building at the center where the doctor's offices were and, and, uh, and there were meetings with patients there and gatherings and the, the two different entrances on either side. And um, I don't really, this image uh, on the left, there seems to be a kind of a zoo or something. Um, so anyway, it, it looked like maybe a fun place to be. <laughs> they hoped it would be. Uh, and then this is the private Bloomingdale Asylum, which was up farther uptown in a um, rural setting that Margaret actually had, um, she went to a Valentine's Day party there. That's part of what shows up in my book. And, the, and there was dancing, and this was 
what convinced her that it was really um, a healthful place doing a good job. Um, and this is the House of Refuge, which I think was for uh, young vagrants, maybe juvenile delinquents. Um, and she, uh, part of, uh, she had a kind of unfortunate failed love affair while in New York, and and her this cad left <laughs> left town. And as she was sorrowing, she spent a lot of time in this in the female wing of the House of Refuge. Um, and said that she, um, you know, this is part of her feeling that these, these spurned women, these fall, fallen women, she didn't consider them fallen, um, she felt a, a great, um, you know, com communality, commonality with them. And uh, so this is why I was very interested to see what the place looked like. Um, this is 1832 before, I guess probably when this was new also, you see the small trees again. Um, but it was another decade later that she was spending time there, um, trying to do what she could to help the women there. Um, so, leaping to um, Rome, uh, another really exciting um, find, I can't really call it a find because it wasn't my find, but um, I was giving a talk at um, a reunion at Radcliffe and a woman in the audience um, turned out to be another descendant of uh, Fuller. <laughs> this was Lucilla Fuller Marble, who's maybe your cousin? Yeah. And um, she said that, you know, she, well, she identified herself and said that she had some, a couple of letters and also these engravings that she had grown up with um, in, in her father's house and, and now were hers. And um, these were, images that survived the shipwreck, which is really hard to imagine how anything on paper could have survived the shipwreck, but a fair amount of things did, and, and um, if you talk to paper conservators, you understand that things get wet and then they dry, and if you dry them carefully, uh, even the ink can, can stay on it. So this was um, one of, I think, three images that uh, Lucilla has, um, Michelangelo Cypress's Rome, by um, an engraver named Strutt, who was famous for his images of trees. He's an English artist. Um, but I like this one, and I'll show you another one later, because I think they really capture the, well, you know, we obviously know that she liked them, she bought them, she was bringing them back, and, and um, her love affair with Giovanni Assoli was initially kind of conducted among, like she would write about their walks among the cloisters and ruins of Rome, and this, you know, kind of figures in the foreground make me think of, of her meetings with Asoli, perhaps. Perhaps she was thinking about that while she was, as she looked at these images herself. Um, and this is another uh, item that survived the shipwreck. It's uh, Margaret Fuller's Roman journal that uh, is in the Houghton Library at Harvard, where most of her papers are. Um, I've used it as the um, end papers for the book, so you can see this image in the book. Um, and though her manuscript, her great book about the, the Roman Republic didn't survive, this journal did, and, and you know, here are things like treachery, the troops of the line have fired on the dragoons, um, crying Viva Pio, uh, this is the, <coughs> was the deposed pope, um, or the, the, the pope who, who kind of fled and um, the whole siege of Rome was about France trying to restore the Pope to power. So that, it was just exciting to have this and to you know, know it was in her hand and to see, um, if you see the whole thing, it's kind of a weathered book and the edges are, are kind of rumpled the way something that had been wet might be. Or, um, so that was exciting. And then this other, this letter um, is another thing that came to my attention because somebody heard me talk and said, oh, you know, do you know about this letter? Um, and uh, this is a letter, you know, all of Fuller, pretty much all of Fuller's letters, all of Emerson's letters, all of these big folks are in print now, but here was an Emerson letter uh, that nobody knew about, or only a few people did. Um, it's in the uh, Swedenborgian School of Religions archives in Berkeley, which is part of the Pacific School of Religion at Berkeley. Um, 
And it's uh, just a fascinating letter. I wrote about it, maybe some of you read in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago, um, written by Emerson to um, the collector of the Port of New York a couple of weeks after the shipwreck. And um, so he says, immediately on hearing of the wreck, he's writing, I dispatched a friend to Fire Island to collect in behalf of the family, uh, uh, friends of Madame Sully, any effects, blah, blah, blah. So this is Thoreau, who he had sent down to um, to the beach at Fire Island to see if he could find the manuscript or anything else. Um, and then what was really extraordinary about the letter, these lists that no one has seen before that Thoreau actually made of, of uh, there were some survivors of the wreck, so they could tell him what was lost. And so therefore, Emerson wanted Hugh Maxwell to know what to look for. So he just writes this out, you know, the two pretty large trunks and two smaller trunks and a pretty large case full of books, and this just really, you know, helps you understand what, what she had with her and what she valued. And um, this letter appeared, uh, unfortunately, kind of after I finished writing the book, and I was um, looking at it for, for a little tidbits that I could include, kind of stick in at the last minute. And there was this one item that, um, so, in short, I didn't really think about it very deeply, and there was this one item on the list that kind of puzzled me, and it was only a couple of months ago that I actually, maybe as I was making these slides and looking at them really carefully and thinking, what would people ask? Um, this number four, which says, a tin box painted lead color on the voyage over the initials MF, which I have a little highlight of that. and. I just kept puzzling over this, a tin box painted lead color on the voyage over the initials MF. Um, you know, first of all, why did Emerson go into such detail to identify it? What, you know, why were these initials painted over? And um, I don't know, does anyone have a guess about this? If you're a, a follower of the Fuller saga, you might have a guess. I, anyway. Uh, yeah, in the back. Proud of her married initials? I think that's it. I think that's it. She had become MFO. And as she was coming back, um, just didn't want to have this special tin box um, with the wrong initials. Anyway, we won't really know what was in her mind, but um, I thought that was really very poignant. Um, along with this list, list on the bottom, which also is um, about her jewelry, two large family seal rings, two smaller ladies' rings, one with white stones, one breast pin, one eyeglass with heavy gold handles and chain. And then this is the last page with Emerson's signature, which was just kind of exciting to see. I had read all these letters in print, but I hadn't really held a letter of his before. Um, and I guess I'll just end with this slide um, of Tasso's Oak in Rome, another of the engravings that Lucilla, um, his, this one is in the book, and um, I, I love it because uh, it was clear that this was a place that she had walked with Giovanni and looked out at the same uh, view of Rome from the Janiculum Hill. And um, anyway, it, it brought me closer to that time in her life. And, I hope it's brought you closer, too. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, just one or two questions, maybe, if somebody's been, yeah. Who's one of the Is Emerson College named after Ralph Waldo Emerson? Emerson College is not named after Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's named after Charles Wesley Emerson, who was a cousin of his of a younger generation and who was a great, um, elocutionist, as, but he was also a Unitarian minister, so, um, and, but people usually confuse that, and, and um, I guess I don't mind if they do. <laughs> <laughs> How did living with Margaret Fuller and writing the book change your view of her? Did you think she was somebody How did living with Margaret Fuller and writing the book change me? Wow, that's a biographer's question, of course. <laughs> um, well, you know, I, it's funny, I had, I, in writing about the Peabody sisters, um, uh, these were three very different women, but also strong-minded. But I felt I could really connect with each of them in one way or another. And, and in fact, Margaret Fuller, who, who was 
bossy and, uh, and proud of her intellect and um, trying to make her own way in life was not always that nice to, or particularly to Elizabeth Peabody, the oldest of them, who went out of her way to help Margaret gather her class for the conversations and, and, and find her writing jobs for publications. And, and so I did have kind of a chip on my shoulder about Margaret Fuller, but, um, but one of the reasons I wrote the Peabody Sisters was to show that there were other interesting women in this movement besides Fuller. And when I finished that book, which was a two-decade labor, and started saying this to people, and they said, well, who's Margaret Fuller? I thought, this is something I have to fix. So um, I, I went after the project, and of course, her, she's just so uh, prescient about gender relations. She's so, you know, her language is so modern in many ways, and I, I really fell in love with her, and I had to, you know, put aside my loyalty to the Peabody sisters as one, one thing that changed. And, but um, I think, you know, while I was writing on her, about her, I was able to put aside my own sense of kind of intimidation at her intellect, all she had known, and and feel um, inspired and connected and, you know, at, at moments when she left her son behind to go travel, to cover the revolution in Rome, you know, I sort of identified in my own little way, having left my kids to go do my research on my biographies at times. Um, and the curious thing is now that I've finished the book, I sort of feel intimidated by her again. <laughs> and I have to start reading it again. And, and, and remember that she she was a woman like us, and I think that's what she was trying to say. She was trying to use her great intellect and extraordinary experience to to connect with women and, and uh, help us all become empowered. And, and I hope maybe I'm a little more empowered as a result of working on Margaret Fuller. So one last question. How do you begin the process of the research for a project like this of this magnitude? Oh, well, you know. Um, Somebody once advised me that whenever you come across a book, and I guess it's a little bit different now because we have e-books, but um, whenever you come across anything uh, that's relevant to your subject, just buy it, and um, uh, you know you'll regret it if you don't. Um, so, in the case of Margaret Fuller, because her letters are um, in in print um, in six volumes, a wonderful edited uh, um, set. I bought all those six volumes, and I bought all the volumes of the Emerson letters that I could. There's one volume that's um, full of additions and things that you just really, it's very hard to get. I'm sure it's here, though. <laughs> um, I had to keep going to the library like that every time I wanted to see it. Um, um, and then I was lucky that I was living near Houghton Library, and, um, and so I wanted to see everything that was, that I could there that was not in print. And the first thing I called up was that Roman diary because I was just really astonished that it existed at all. Um, and uh, well, you'll see if you read the opening of, of the book, there was a message for me in that journal. I thought. So, but I, that was it. Was really important to me when I worked on the Peabody Sisters. I was working only with manuscript material. They weren't well known enough to have their letters in print. And I was really worried in writing about Fuller that I wouldn't have that same uh, connection if I didn't have these actual documents. So, but but I but there were enough things that were uh, not in print. Um, there were some childhood essays that she wrote that were just very meaningful to me, and these engravings. Um, I, I, every time I came across something there were, that you know hadn't been in print, I would I would often find a way to use it, and, and I'm very you know, proud of those parts of the book. So, well, thank you very much. And